and how we own our energy. We need an energy system that brings energy, clean energy, to the two billion people around the world who don't have access to any energy at the moment. But it also means making sure we have warm homes for the 30,000 people who die needlessly each year because they have to make a choice between heating their homes or eating. It means an end to the profits of the big six. It means an ownership of ordinary people and ordinary communities to own our energy systems. We also know we live in a world where each day 30,000 people die needlessly from, un from avoidable illnesses. We know we live in a world where one billion people don't have ac access to fresh water. Where millions of our fellow citizens around the world live a precarious life, live a life where they're not able to eat enough, yet this planet produces more than enough food, where we bury half the food we consume because of the industrial agricultural system that our food is produced in. We have solutions. We have real solutions like agroecology, which could, which could feed 15 billion people in this world. It's not a question of can we produce enough food. It's a question of who owns our food systems. That's why we're here, because we want a democratic system that controls our energy and our food systems. I wanted to talk about three other very, very pertinent things. We've seen week after week thousands of our fellow citizens from around the world lying down, face down, in the Mediterranean. 1,500 people dead just in the last three months. Three and a half thousand last year that we know about. These are people whose names we will never know, whose faces most of us will never see. We'll never know what their dreams or aspirations were, whether what football team they supported, or whether they've got parents or siblings sitting at home wondering where their loved ones are. We do know that those people they are the effect of our dirty energy system. They are the impacts of our consumption of dirty energy, of our broken economic system. Because when you look at where those people come from, they come from countries like Eritrea, they come from countries like Mali, where the Sahel, 15 countries, have, have, have suffered one of the worst droughts ever known in Africa. Where we know that agriculture in Africa is already decreasing by 15% in terms of yields, pushing millions and millions of people, not just from subsistence level, but now to a, to a situation where they have to choose death in America, I mean, death in the United States, death in Africa, or a possible death crossing the Mediterranean. And what's our response? What's our government's response? Our government's response was to cut the funding for those rescue boats. And what's their response now when they see the dead bodies coming, when they see the revolt of an ordinary people saying we must do something? Their response is, let's bomb the smugglers. Let's bomb the boats of the smugglers. Not let's take action to stop climate change. Let's not take action to see what are the drivers of now these migrants and refugees. Because friends, now, we live in a world where more people, are cre more environmental refugees are created each year than are created by conflict. Where more conflict is driven because of resource conflicts, of resource conflicts such as access over fresh water or land. We're happy to bomb and invade countries over controlling of dirty energy sources, but we won't take any of the refugees that our bombing creates. And friends, we've seen across the water in the United States names of black men, Eric Gardner, Michael Gray, those names and the names of every other week of a young black man dying in the United States. Now, where there are more black men in prison 
than they were under slavery, where more black men are dying at the hands of a police force and a judicial system that died under lynching. And you might think, why am I raising that? I'm an environmentalist. I'm an environmental justice activist. I'm from Friends of the Earth. Because that is a symptom of a broken economic system, of a broken political system. It's a symptom of when Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans. That United States, the richest country in the world, didn't take action to protect its citizens. Did left these black citizens the last to be rescued from Katrina. And that millions of those people are still without homes and displaced across the United States. And of course, all of us have seen in the last few weeks the image and the footage coming out of Nepal after the devastating hurricane there. 10,000 people now, the Nepalese government is saying, will have died because of that earthquake. I know that earthquake wasn't there because of climate change, but those deaths are there because of an economic system which leaves Nepal one of the poorest countries in the world, where an average Nepalese citizen will earn less than $1,000 a year, where every two days a Nepalese migrant will die in Qatar. Just a Nepalese, not a Pakistani, not a Bangladeshi, but every two days a young Nepalese man will die in Qatar building and constructing because millions and millions of Nepalese people are forced to migrate around the world. The people who died in Nepal died because they came from a poor country, from a poor country with a poor infrastructure. And that is the reality of climate change as is its devastations impact more and more and more the poorest in the world will be the ones who die. They'll be the ones who die because of their food systems. They'll be the ones who die because they won't have fresh water. But they'll also be the ones who die because their infrastructure doesn't allow a society to be able to deal with the impacts of climate change. I've, and my friends and colleagues and comrades in the Philippines who've been on the ground in Tacloban where the typhoon Rian hit, this is one typhoon. These were typhoons that were once every hundred years, then became every ten years, and now are every other year. Super typhoons devastating many parts of Southeast Asia. Friends, that's why we're here, because we are trying to build a movement, a build a movement that recognizes that tackling climate change is fundamentally an issue about tackling justice. And when we're tackling justice, then that really means we need a democratic system. We need to fix our broken economic system. We need to fix our broken political system. We need a new system where we as ordinary people connect, stand side by side, not just with the poorest and most vulnerable in this country, but the poorest and most vulnerable all around the world. Because we can live in a better world. Another world is possible. But that's only possible if, friends, we make it. So I hope today we can keep building and sustaining that movement and that network. We can show solidarity with each other and can build towards building a powerful climate justice movement in this country. Thank you, friends.